Turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. We're going to be starting in verse 18. And as you're turning there, John MacArthur shared a story when he was young in the ministry. He was on a flight from across country, and he was sitting there, had his Bible open. He was just studying and doing his thing, and a young man came and sat next to him and noticed that John actually had the Bible open, and he point blank asked him this question. He said, I I see you're reading the Bible. Could, Could you tell me how to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Whoa. Has that ever happened to you? Like anybody? I mean, how rare of a situation is that? My, my question to you is, what would you have said in that situation? What would you have done if somebody point blank asked you, how can I have a personal relationship with Jesus? Well, John takes some time and he explains to him the gospel And then and there, the man prayed to receive Christ. And a few weeks later, he was baptized there at John MacArthur's church. But as time went on, he started seeing this man less and less. And he said the last interaction he actually had with the man didn't end well. That this man apparently had no desire to be in church, had no desire to to do anything with with Jesus, had no desire for, for spiritual matters. I mean, what... What could have gone wrong? I mean, this man was a great candidate for salvation, asking the right question at the right time to a right person. And yet he had fallen away from the faith. Jesus, in our story today, has a very similar situation. In today's passage, we'll see how Jesus handled a similar situation. And if I'm honest, the more I studied the passage these past few weeks, the more I realized that Jesus' form of evangelism here It's very different than probably what we would call modern day evangelism. In fact, I probably would wager a guess that Jesus probably would have failed evangelism 101 in many of our seminary classes the way he handled this situation. But if this is how Jesus handles a situation like this, there's something for us to pay attention to because he's the Lord of all and he knows hearts and minds. And so we're going to follow Jesus' example. And as we examine this text today in Luke chapter 18, we're all, as we look at this historical account, we're also going to encounter how Muslims, atheists, liberals, and prosperity preachers all misinterpret Jesus over and over again. So if you have your Bible, let's stand and read together. I'll read it out loud. You stand with me in honor of God's holy word. Luke chapter 18, we're going to be starting in verse 18. I'm going to read all the way down to verse 30, but we're really going to focus on verse uh, 18 through 27. But let me read 18 through 30. Let's read. So it says, a ruler questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, behold, we have left our Homes and have followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time in the age to come eternal life. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are not a silent God. You're not distant, but you are close. And Lord, you communicate to us through the Bible, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray and recognize today the the frailty and the feebleness of preaching, that with human lips that you would have communicated heavenly truths. Lord, I know I'm not up to the task. No one is. 
But Lord, you've still called us to examine your word, to study your word, to proclaim your word, and to ultimately obey it. So Lord, I pray, God, that our hearts would be encouraged this morning and challenged. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've titled this message, Threading the Camel. And the simple takeaway of this message is that salvation is only possible with God. And I want to break this text down into three points. The first point is the man. We're going to look at a character profile of who we like to call the rich young ruler. Now, something I had never really noticed until, until studying this passage, that he has mentioned in Mark chapter 10, he's mentioned in Matthew chapter 19, and he's mentioned here in Luke chapter 18. And we're actually going to borrow from all three of those texts to look at this profile of this man as kind of the composite of the, the, the fullness of the, this his, historical record. And all, all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all identify this man as rich. He was rich in the sense of probably how many of us would think of wealth. You know, we, he probably had gold and, and silver, and he probably had property. And, and, you know, we think of wealth in that regards. But in, in a, the, this time of, of Israel's history, and we think about the Old Testament, it goes, it goes a little bit beyond that. Because if you think about property, it's not just having a house. It's having produce that you could be able to sell from your house. It's having to have livestock. You think about how many of the Old Testament patriarchs were marked by how much uh, livestock they had as their wealth. So he probably had a lot of stuff, a lot of money, a lot of property, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, a lot of produce, had a lot of that. And it was a family situation oftentimes uh, that it's, it's, a, it's passed on through generations. So a good portion of his, in, his wealth was probably inherited to him. Now he is kind of described here as the patriarch, as the main steward of that. But there's family ties to this wealth. And also, he probably earned a lot of this himself over time through what we can assume are favorable business deals. Because if you jump over to the book of Mark, when Jesus lists the commands to the man of what he should have obeyed over time, one of them that Mark adds is do not defraud, which assumes that he actually dealt business fairly. So he was a rich man, probably some of it inherited and most of it through his own good business dealings. But only Matthew mentions him as young. Now, usually a young man in, in biblical times is someone who's described in their 30s and 40s. If you look at when Jesus started his earthly ministry, he did not start until he was about the age of 30. And that's because the Jews would not have taken anybody seriously in a teaching ministry until you've reached that age. It's kind of when you fully reach adulthood. And so this man probably was in his 30s or 40s, so he's described as young in the book of Matthew. And only Luke describes him as a ruler. So between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's where we get the title, rich, young, ruler. What was he a ruler of? Well, the scripture doesn't say, but there are some historical uh, clues and we can kind of narrow down our options. First is he most likely was not a ruler in any Roman or military capacity. As a Jew, he probably would not have been serving in the Roman military, and if he was, which is a very rare occasion, he, not, he would not have been highly ranked at all. And the Jews at the time were not allowed to have their own military, so he couldn't have been serving there either. So we can, we can rule out the Roman military or a Jewish military. More likely, he probably was a ruler in the sense of either a San, somebody in the Sanhedrin, like a Pharisee, or he could have been just a really prominent community Leader, He may not have been actually in the Sanhedrin because Luke does a really good job of actually spelling out when he's talking about the Pharisees. And this time he doesn't spell it out. So the, the ambiguity of it kind of has us leaning a little bit more towards a community leader. And in fact, he probably could have been a ruler of a synagogue. Why is that a big deal? Well, for one, synagogue rulers typically were older men. Older men have the track record have the life, have the experience, have the maturity that can be looked at to say, hey, hey, this guy's pious, this guy's religious, he, sh he should be in charge because we've seen the, 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 the track record of his life. And yet if he is a ruler of a synagogue, that's pretty impressive because his wealth would not have gotten him in the position of a ruler of a synagogue, though it wouldn't have hurt him 
But that would show how pious and how religious this man is if he was indeed a ruler of a synagogue. So he's a rich young ruler. Don't we all want to be that? Don't we all want to be rich and young and have influence and authority? Doesn't that just sound good? Man, man, he, he looks like, on the outset, he looks like the perfect candidate, doesn't he? I mean, if, this, if a guy like this walked into our doors today, we're like, okay, we're going to make him a deacon. We're going to put him on the finance team. Like all these things, we, we jump after people like this. We don't see Jesus jumping here. And he was a Jew, That's important, too, because he would have had the exact same doctrinal commitments as Jesus did as a Jew. Jesus didn't have to convince him that there's a God. Jesus didn't have to convince him of the authority of the scriptures. He already had that. There was no proof needed. He was a Jew and had the same doctrinal commitments. He actually even had a couple things going for him outside of being a Jew and being rich and young and a ruler. In fact, he had what I would call, he had the correct dilemma. He knew something was missing. Why else would such a pious person come to Jesus and ask such a huge question? He knew something was missing from his life. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever thought something is missing in my life? I believe that God puts a hole in all of our hearts that only he can fill. And this man knew it. He had the right dilemma. He asked the right question. What do I do to inherit eternal life. Now we can debate how he phrased the question because there is nothing we can ever do in terms of good works to merit eternal life. But as we'll look later, there is something we do to receive it. So there's nothing he's going to do to to earn it, but there is something he could do to receive it. So he asked the right question. And, And when you think about eternal life, now maybe in our Western mindsets, we often think of life that never ends. And that's correct, but that's a secondary issue to what the Jews would have thought at this time. Eternal life to them was not so much the quantity of time, it was a quality of life. It's a type of life that humans don't possess. It's a type of life that only God possesses. It's a life filled with holiness and righteousness and goodness and what the the Jewish term of shalom is, of peace and wholeness, he knew he did not have this kind of life. As religious as he was, he, he, he was asking the right question about eternal life. He even came to the right source. He came to Jesus. And Jesus is the source of eternal life. He had the right dilemma. He had the right question. He had the right source. And he had the right attitude. How do I know that? Well, if you go over to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, when it describes how this This episode begins. It says the man came running to Jesus. Dignified men in this time did not run. We know this from the story of the prodigal son. When the father runs after the son, that was an undignified thing for a dignified man to do. But he was not concerned about his reputation. He had a dilemma that he had to have resolved he, he had a desperate desire to know the answer to his question that he did the best that he could in his life. And yet he knew something was still missing. Also in Mark chapter 10, it mentions that not only did he run, but when he got there, he knelt. As a man who was a ruler, a man sat in authority, he knows the posture that he needs to take in order to, to show the correct respect and honor to somebody else who had the authority to answer his question. So this, we see this biographical profile of a man who was rich, he was young, he was powerful, had the Jewish faith. He came to Jesus with the right dilemma, the right question, asking the right source and with the right attitude. But as we already read, things didn't turn out the way he had hoped. So let's get into that. The second thing here is the challenge. And it's a threefold challenge. Is back and forth that he has with Jesus. First of all, he calls him good teacher. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And so the first challenge that Jesus gives to him is this challenge on the nature of goodness. The nature of goodness. By calling Jesus good, the man was doing one of two things. He either believed that Jesus was somehow of God or from God, 
or he completely misunderstood the nature of what true goodness is. If it was he, he truly believed that Jesus was somehow from God or of God, then Jesus, when he challenges him, basically could be interpreted this way. If you really think that I'm good and therefore of God or from God, then wouldn't it be reasonable to conclude that whatever I tell you next is the correct answer to your question and that you should fully submit to it? That's the implication. In Mark chapter 10, though, when he addresses him again, he doesn't call him good teacher. He just calls him teacher. He drops the good because he was challenged on that notion. And so maybe there's an indication that he didn't actually think he was from God. Maybe it's the second one where he completely misunderstands the nature of true goodness. That only God alone is good in the truest sense. So Jesus is exposing this man's flippant theology. And in and, and this challenge then, the question that he'd be posing to him could be interpreted this way. How is it that you so carelessly use the word good when you know how clear the scriptures are about the goodness of God and the depravity of man? I mean, if he was as pious as people think he is, how did he, how is he so far off the mark with his use of the term good? If you read the book of Romans and you read how Paul spells out the depravity of man that no one seeks after God, there's no one righteous, no, not one, you read the, all those passages, he is borrowing heavily from the book of Psalms, heavily. And so this pious Jew should have known all of these scriptures already, and yet he was missing the point of what true goodness is. Now, I, I do want to kind of do a side tangent here. This doesn't mean that you can't be like, how are you this morning? You can't be like, well, Chris said I can't say good anymore because only God's good. Don't get weird about it, okay? Because <laughs> elsewhere in Scripture, it does describe people as good. Um, Joseph of Arimathea was described as a good man. There's many problems about what a good man is. But in the sense of how it's compared to God, only God is purely good. We are just lesser degrees of bad, essentially, <laughs> Right? And so only God is good. And so Jesus is challenging this man on his, the, the nature of goodness. Now, there is a secondary component here that we want to touch on briefly, and it's about the deity of Christ himself, because Muslims and atheists will look at this and go, aha, look, Jesus doesn't claim to be God. He says it right here. No, he doesn't. He didn't claim to be God, and he didn't deny it either. You can't use this passage to talk about the deity of Jesus, or the denial of the deity of Jesus. But we do have passages like Matthew 26, 63 through 65, and John chapter 8 through uh, uh, verses 58 through 59, where Jesus spells it out for the Jews that he is equal with the Father, and therefore God, and therefore divine, because their reactions are to kill him. Their reactions are to call him a blasphemer. And so when we look at those texts and then import that information here, it makes what Jesus said extremely ironic. Almost like, <laughs> you know, only God's good, right? <clears throat> Why do you call me good? It's kind of like that. And so it's not, this is not a passage where we can definitively say that Jesus was, dis, was denying his deity or affirming it, but Muslim, Muslims and atheists are off here. This is not a text they can use for that. And in fact, they fall on a harder sword because if they, they say that, then they can't say Jesus is good either because that's what Jesus is saying here. And they all want to say, well, Jesus was a pretty good guy. Well, based on your own logic, you can't use this passage altogether. So there you go. So Jesus challenges the man on his notion of what goodness is and that goodness belongs to God alone. The second thing he challenges him with is this, his ability to keep the law. Now he, ex, he explains here, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Book of Mark adds in the do not defraud, which we mentioned earlier. And Matthew adds, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you look at all of those, they all have a common thread. And that common thread is commandments that are given as a man-to-man -man relationship. They're all horizontal relationships. There is a glaring absence of the man to God, of the vertical commandments here. And Jesus is going to come back to that very, very soon. <clears throat> and it, 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 
probably stands to reason that the man actually never actually heard Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew. Because when he talks about adultery, he's not just talking about the action, he's talking about the intent of the heart. That's also wicked. That's also evil. And that murder is not just the action, it's the intent of the heart. That is also evil and wicked. I mean, most likely this man, like most of us, probably broke every single one of these commandments from the moment he woke up to the, when he got to Jesus and did not realize it because of how deep sin goes in our lives. But you can really think about this as kind of Jesus is like playing along with them just to see what happens. You know, he's kind of playing along almost in a sarcastic manner because Jesus knows this man cannot keep the law. The truth of the matter is none of us can keep the law. Not only that, we can't even keep our own standards. Have you ever thought about that? You may say, oh, you know, it's, it's a bad thing to lie, and yet you still lie. You may think, oh, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to be rude to people, and yet you're rude to people, aren't you? <laughs> I know I can be. We don't even hold our own standards, let alone God's, and Jesus knows this. And playing along, Jesus is trying to show the man that something must be seriously wrong if he's kept the law since his youth and still something's missing. Have you thought about that? That if he's truly kept the law and something's still missing, what does that tell us? The law is not designed to bring about salvation. You're not going to be saved from keeping the law, even if he did it. The law is there. It's designed to show us our need for salvation. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 and Romans 3, 20 tell us this specifically, that the law is our tutor. The law was there to help us to understand how great and how holy and how good God is and how far short we fall of his holiness. The law is, a, is supposed to expose that in our hearts. And when we try to keep the law more, all it does is expose all the more that we still fall short. It's really there to point us to the fact that we desperately need God's supernatural intervention. That's what the law does for us. Matthew 19, 17, uh, in the same narrative here, Jesus responds this way. He says, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And by this, Jesus is revealing that only by perfectly perfectly keeping the law can one have eternal life. Because think about the logic here. If anyone who lives perfectly, they don't need salvation and therefore wouldn't have a deep sense that something is wrong or something is missing. Praise the Lord, there was one who perfectly kept the law and his name is Jesus. And because of that, he is the only perfect substitute to be sacrificed for our sins. He was the spotless Lamb of God. The only way that we can stand before a holy God is by having a righteousness that is equal to his. Have you ever thought about that? The only way you're ever going to stand before God is to have a holiness and a righteousness that's equal to his. But we are never going to have that on our own. Never. We need a righteousness that's outside of ourselves, that comes from a different source. And praise God, Jesus offers us that through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so he challenges the man on his ability to keep the law. And again, he's talking about these horizontal aspects. He's kind of playing along with them to see what's going to happen. The last thing he challenges him on is the man's idolatry. Here's a really interesting thing that I was studying this week. In Mark chapter 10, where the same passage is being played out, before Jesus answers the question, what am I missing? What have I still lacked? Before Jesus answers him, Mark inserts this. It's very important. It says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Why is that important? Because Jesus, right at the moment where the scripture says he loved him, is when he's going to about to land the killing blow. 
Something I've been thinking about a lot recently is how much our society has hijacked the English language. Have you ever thought about that? And we could talk all day long about words that don't mean what they used to mean and, and vice versa. But there are two words, and I want you all to think about this this afternoon when you're eating lunch. Maybe you all have a deep conversation. We'll see. I think there are two words that are in, in particular that our, our society has completely redefined that make it so hard for us to share with them the truth and the beauty of the gospel. And the first word, I think, is sin. If you can redefine sin, it's hard to expose what actually is sin in people's lives. We've seen this even through the court systems. They've redefined sin. But the second word is love. And if you can redefine those two words, the biblical gospel no longer makes sense to them because they don't have terms that agree with what Scripture says. And it's interesting because, you know, again, Mark chapter 10, Jesus, before he lands the killing blow, says that he loved him. Liberals and progressives they don't want to read this type of Jesus into the Bible. They want to get a Jesus out of the Bible that's all about love and all about acceptance and all about fighting power and standing up, you know, for these kind of things. But Jesus often portrays himself in a very opposite way, the way liberals and progressives want him to be betrayed. Because here he loves him, and next thing out of his mouth is the hardest truth this man's ever going to hear in his life. What this tells me about love is that true love tells the truth about sin. True love addresses sin. True love confronts sin. And ultimately, true love seeks to abolish sin. And so he loved him and he gives him this, the the, the killing blow. He says, sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. I noticed in this passage this week that this invitation that Jesus gives to this man is the opposite of prosperity preaching. Because prosperity preachers, you know what they want? They want your money. And you know what they promise in exchange? Earthly blessings. In this passage, Jesus says, I don't want your money. Give it to somebody else. And you're going to have not earthly blessings. You're going to have heavenly blessings. I mean, that's a far better deal than earthly blessings where rust and dust and all that destroys what we have over time. It's going to be wiped away. So he, he, even Jesus here confronts prosperity preaching to sell all that he has, give it to the poor, and he will have treasure in heaven. Again, this is confronting the man's idolatry. And this is how we know, because what we said earlier, there's nothing you can do to, in, to merit or to earn salvation, to earn eternal life. But there are two things that scripture repeats over and over again that we do to receive it. The man had the first one. He had faith. He had belief. Remember, he was a Jew and had the same doctrinal commitments as Jesus. But what he didn't have was repentance. Mark 115 and Acts 20, 21 tell us you have to have faith and repentance to be saved. Wealth was this man's God. Wealth was this man's idol. He had broken the first and most important of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus makes it obvious for him when he tells him to sell everything that he had. Because the first and most important commandment is to have no other gods before me. And this man had a God. Did you know that Jesus... He's in the business of smashing idols. Did you know that? He's in the smashing idol business. And that's for our benefit that he does that. So the question is for us, when we think about this, will we forsake our idols? Those things that we put in the place of God that we think will make us happy or fulfilled in order to let God have his rightful place in our lives. Maybe we could ask it this way. Will we follow Jesus and his commands regardless of how painful it might be or how uncomfortable it might get? Will we still follow Jesus? This man, he came desperate, but he left distraught. He came seeking, but he left sad. Why? 
It says it right here in the passage, because he was extremely rich. Wealth was this man's stability. Wealth was this man's comfort. It was the way he controlled his life. It was the the thing that defined his relationships and his status. In a sense, you could say that wealth made him who he was. It was his identity. But to give, and, 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 and so for him to give up his wealth was in a sense to give up who he was. But can I tell you, friends, this is exactly what Jesus wants for all of us. How do I know that? Well, Luke 9.23 tells us, Jesus said, if anyone were to come after me, you must deny yourself. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that when we are in Christ, we're not who we used to be. We're not old creations. We are new creations. In a society where we, we talk about being our true and authentic self, Jesus says, deny yourself. In essence, Jesus wants to save you from you. He wants to smash our idols, and it's for our benefit that he does that. And the man walks away sad because he was extremely rich. He couldn't give up on his God in order to gain eternal life. He couldn't do it. And here's what's interesting to me. Jesus didn't run after him. He didn't try to stop him in his tracks and go, okay, whoa, whoa, hang on, hang on. Let's try it a different way. Maybe, maybe if I explain it like this, you'll get it. No, 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 no. Jesus gave this man exactly what he needed to hear. And the man himself had to deal with the consequences of his sin. He knew the artificiality of this man's heart. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is not looking for superficial converts. He's looking for committed disciples. Are you one today? Last thing and we'll be done. The explanation. We see here in verses 24 through 30, and I'm really going to stop at verse 27. Jesus says to him, Jesus looks around and and says this. He says, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Well, first of all, let's talk about what this does not mean. That there's been a tradition in some commentaries and some preaching that there was this gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. And if you wanted to go through that gate with your camel, you had to take all the stuff off of the camel and get the camel to crouch down and squeeze through, right? So it's kind of this picture of, you know, if you, if you want to come to God, you, you have to shed yourself of worldly things and humble yourselves. And that all preaches real well, doesn't it? That's a good preaching point. Except the problem is, there has never been a confirmed location called the eye of the needle. So it's just made up preaching, and that's never good. And it actually betrays the context of the disciples' response. Because what they heard was, it's impossible. Jesus took the largest animal that they would have known in their area and said, try to put that through the smallest hole you can think of. How's that going to go? And the disciples, in fact, Matthew and Mark both mention that at first the disciples don't say anything. They're just kind of like there with like deer in headlights. And Jesus has to repeat himself before they open their mouths. They are so taken back by what Jesus said. They're like, who then can be saved is the question. So what Jesus is really trying to get at is the fact that it is impossible for anyone on their own to be saved. But what I love is what Jesus says to us here in verse 27, that things that are impossible with man are possible with God. Praise the Lord that God is able and intervenes in our lives. So to thread a a camel through the eye of a needle, it's an impossibility. No one can be saved. And part of what's playing on in, in, the, in the, the minds of the disciple here, they're realizing there's something off about their theology too, because they assume that if you're wealthy, well, then you must be blessed by God. And you're only blessed by God if you're pious and religious. And in fact, there are records of some Jewish teachings that say if you have enough money, you could in fact pay off your own sin debt. And so it was a cherished thing to want to be wealthy because then you could wipe out your own record of sin through paying it. 
And that's what's in the back of their minds. And Jesus is saying, it's even harder for rich people to be saved. Not easier, it's harder. And the disciples are just taken aback and they ask the question, who then can be saved? But praise God, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Before we close, a few points of clarification. Does this passage teach that any rich person can never be saved? Does this passage teach that it's necessary for all Christians to live impoverished lives? And the answer, you're right, is no. Look at Abraham. Look at Job. Look at David. Those are pretty wealthy dudes. None of them were asked to give up their wealth. In fact, that was used as part of God's plan for redemption. In Luke chapter 8, it suggests that Jesus had wealthy supporters for his ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul gives Timothy instructions about wealthy church members. He didn't ask them to give up their money. He asked them to live holy lives. And in fact, we're reading Luke chapter 18. The next chapter over, Luke 19, Jesus meets a wee little man. Who was that? Zacchaeus. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. When the Savior passed that way, he looked up at the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. What happened when he went to his house? Jesus said salvation has come into this house. And Zacchaeus, on his own will, decided he was going to pay back what he defrauded people. He didn't have to give up everything. Because wealth was not his God power was. Jesus is in the business of smashing idols. Wealth is one of them for many of us, but it's not the only one. What idol could you be dealing with? Because Jesus wants to smash it this morning. So what's the point of all this? Well, first, and we've said it before, but it's worth repeating. Salvation is impossible with man. There's no amount of good you will ever do that can compare to the perfection that is God and that would ever earn you eternal life. But secondly, salvation is possible with and because of God. He has made a way of salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Third, to receive the free gift of eternal life, we must repent of our sins and believe that he is the Lord. Now, this is the hardest one for all of us because we so easily fall into the trap of idolatry. We so fa easily fall into the trap of the things that make us feel happy and fulfilled that belong to God alone. But this is the part where Jesus had confronts this man and says, basically, if you want to come follow me, you have to forsake everything else. Your wealth, your relationships, your desires, and, and your comforts. We have to come to Jesus empty-handed. We have to come to him poor. Both in the book of Luke here and in the book of Matthew, the context, Jesus is teaching about little children coming to him for such is the kingdom of heaven. Children don't have anything to offer. They don't have any good deed or wealth to bring. They're, they're poor, they're empty-handed. We must come to Jesus like children. And that's exactly what he challenged this man to do. And so I wonder, have you ever done that? Have you ever come to the place where you realize that Jesus is more important and is better than anything else that could take the place in your heart? Have you ever forsaken everything to receive him? And if you haven't, are you willing to do that today? The last thing, for we who call ourselves Christians, we who call ourselves disciples of Jesus, if Jesus would have failed a seminary class because of his response to this man, what do we take away from this? What's a reminder to us that it is important. It's not just important, it's an, it's an imperative that we share the full gospel. 
the good parts and the bad parts. It's called good news, but it's only good because something's bad. Jesus didn't preach easy believism. In fact, he put up barriers. He didn't preach easy believism, and neither should we. Jesus wasn't interested in superficial converts, and neither should we. And Jesus was not shy about addressing sin, and neither should we. May we all, with all our hearts, forsake the things of this world so that we might gain Jesus, the source of eternal life. And may we all, having fully embraced him as Lord and Savior, be diligent, be bold, wise, and gracious to share the full gospel with a lost and dying world. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online, and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.